focus on um, looking at mortuary practice in the Mesolithic of Northwest Europe, and in particular, um, our approach to a particular category of material, um, and that's human bone in a disarticulated state. Um, and I'm just going to focus on the effect um, that our scientific techniques and sort of methods of analysis might have on our, our kind of theorising about this material. Um, so if you're not <laughs> familiar with the Mesolithic um, mortuary record, this is a whirlwind tour of the fact that it's very variable. Um, we have inhumations in cemeteries, um, as well as sort of single or small groups of burials, um, some in middens, um, but also cremation and disarticulated bones deposited in places like middens, caves, um, occupation layers, wetlands, those kinds of things. Um, and we're often making a distinction between um, inhumations and this other material um, when it comes to kind of analysis and interpretation. And particularly this um, disarticulated material gets kind of lumped together as, as loose human bone, it's been called. Um, and so we end up with this kind of um, distinction between uh, a line drawn basically between the inhumations um, and this other material. Uh, actually, it's more like this kind of wiggly line because the cremations tend to get main sort of thought about with inhumations, but they don't really get talked about either. Um, so there's inhumation and then uh, loose bone, basically. Um, and I think that's perhaps because the disarticulated material is kind of less readily familiar to us. It's not always seen as normative. It's sometimes considered as a deviant practice. It's not really recognisable or recognised as a result of, of mortuary practices. Um, and I think that's why we end up with some very generic statements um, in our interpretations of this material. So some people refer to it as evidence for complex mortuary practices, um, or people have offered up a whole list of all the possible practices that it might represent. Um, we also have interpretations of um, cannibalism, and these are equally as generic, actually, um, when we consider the varied types of activities and motivations that we see, uh, you know, that can be covered by the term um, cannibalism. Um, so it's received less attention, and I think that's really because this material hasn't always been able to answer the same um, kind of fairly traditional questions that have been asked of inhumations and cemeteries relating to sort of social status, hierarchy, um, gender roles, and things like that. Um, and so we have um, basically a long established, I think the reason for this is that we have a long established methodological and analytical kind of set of techniques and theoretical frameworks for understanding um, inhumation. Um, and obviously inhumation is quite recognisable to us as, um, you know, incontroversial evidence for mortuary um, practice. Inhumation of a complete body shortly after death, placed in a grave, accompanied by objects, animal remains, other people, all those kinds of things. And we've got the osteological techniques to determine age, biological sex, health, lifestyle, bioarchaeology techniques for diet and things like that. And we have theoretical frameworks to think about the role of grave goods, um, whether that be status, relational aspects of identity, or those kinds of things. Um, and obviously some of those can still apply um, to the disarticulated material, but it's not always as easy to create those kind of aspects of individual identity that people tend to focus on. Um, and so the methodologies for looking at this material are less well established. Um, disarticulated materials often sort of lump together when actually it might represent lots of different practices and things going on because there are lots of ways in which a body um, can become disarticulated. Um, and we need osteological analysis of these assemblages to determine this kind of taphonomic history, how, how they became uh, loose or disarticulated. Um, you know, is it deliberate disarticulation by humans or animals as funerary treatment, uh, through kind of dismemberment or secondary burial or exposure? Um, is it resulting from disturbed burial? Um, what are the specific practices that have generated uh, this material? And so until we can sort of methodologically identify what this material represents, uh, we can't really develop theoretical frameworks um, to think about the broader significance um, of this material for Mesolithic beliefs. Um, so we could also, we could draw on those theoretical frameworks from other periods, other periods have disarticulated material, um, and but we don't really want to apply those specific theoretical frameworks yeah. until we really know what it is we're dealing with. So we don't want to look at Chapman's fragmentation and chainment theories if we don't really know what it is that we're looking at in the Mesolithic. Um, and 
detailed kind of ostological analysis has shown in the Neolithic, for example, that this can um, this detailed work can challenge these kind of overarching narratives. Um, so Crozier's work on Neolithic or Orkney, for example. Um, so a few people have started looking at um, this material with kind of scientific techniques. Um, and basically, often there's osteological analysis and spatial work that's been done, but not always um, work that looks at representation of the material or the kind of degree of fragmentation of the material. Um, so these people have started to kind of look at these things. Um, I'm just going to keep going so I don't run out of time. Um, and they're using these kinds of uh, methodologies, basically trying to identify the taphonomic history of the material. So borrowing methodologies that are more frequently used in, in zoo archaeology. Um, so trying to um, look at fragmentation, refitting elements, um, quantifying fragments, producing a proper sort of minimum number of elements that are minimum number of individuals and then thinking about what elements of the body are represented and what kind of processes have affected that representation. Um, so just as a quick example I suppose to illustrate that um, I'm just going to look at uh, the Knockoig Midden on Oranze. Um, about 49 um, human elements were found dispersed within this midden um, and these range from cranial elements to teeth elements of the torso, limbs, and the hands and feet. Um, and this material has been quantified, but there's never really been analysis of the representation of different elements of the skeleton that are there. And despite this, you will most often hear the material referred to as being dominated by hand and foot bones, um, especially um, the groups two and three in that diagram. Um, now, hand and foot bones might actually physically outnumber other elements in the assemblage. But this is partly a product of the fact that we have more hands and foot bones in our body. So a single person's got 106 hand and foot bones, but only two clavicles. Um, so it's partly to do with this. And it's in the assemblage as a whole, actually, um, the clavicle and the cranium are the best represented elements. Um, so we're just looking at the black line on this graph. Um, and so I've highlighted um, basically the areas that are best, best represented um, and this is looking at based on the minimum number of individuals how many clavicles we'd expect and how many we actually found um, so it's a representation index um, and actually the vertebrae the pelvis and the tibia are as well represented um, as the hands and feet which are in the green boxes um, so that's basically so you know, until we do this kind of analysis, these kinds of things are, are misleading us about the material a little bit. Um, I used those, the suite of kind of taphonomic techniques as well to talk about this Mesolithic site um, in the Netherlands, and I'm not going to go into the results in detail, um, but that was successful in showing that this assemblage of material, you know, um, was the result of deliberate um, practices where people are carrying out multi-stage kind of funerary rites with this uh, material. So starting with explanation, possibly dismembering the body, um, depositing some elements on the site, taking some to different places. Um, so hopefully that briefly illustrates um, how using some of these analyses can give us more detail about specific practices carried out at these sites. Um, so that's it's successful in that way we get this great information about specifically what's going on, not just disarticulated material. But um, because we're looking at it in this way, this, di this um, methodology just reinforces the dichotomy that we've created between um, disarticulated material um, and inhumation. So our scientific method is kind of feeding into that um, uh, reinforcement of that dichotomy. So obviously, I wouldn't actually see it as a separate practice. Um, or a separate category, but part of um, part of a wider um, consideration of Mesolithic uh, burial practices, which involve accessing the body at different stages of decay, um, and also kind of removing bones and depositing them in, in different places. So, I suppose um, I just wanted to illustrate how, if we look um, specifically at categories of material, and we have to use specific techniques to do that. 
it can start to reinforce the kind of dichotomies we were trying to undermine in the first place. Um, so we still have to remember that these are part of, um, I suppose, wider um, issues, and we want to try and build our theoretical frameworks to take that into account as well. Um, so if we're looking carefully at the range of practices in the Mesolithic, um, there are lots of things that could be responsible for taking, um, uh, could be responsible for creating this kind of disarticulated or, or loose material. Um, so there's a few things that we can kind of take forward uh, from that, that we see lots of variety and diversity in practice, which doesn't seem to have a chronological um, trend to it. Um, and perhaps we're looking at the emergence of sort of regional and individual identities that are um, influencing these kinds of practices. I think the disarticulated material as well also raises some broader questions for the Mesolithic. Um, we've got all these very kind of um, unquestioned labels that we apply to things like refuse deposits or settlement and occupation deposits. What does it mean that there's human bone um, in these deposits? Um, is it refuse? Is it settlement occupation? Should we be using those labels? Um, how can we think about this kind of identification of cannibalism, which is so uh, fundamentally at an ontological level based on um, the equivalency of the treatment of human and animal bone, assuming that animals are always butchered for food, um, and that therefore if you see equivalent treatment, humans are being eaten too. How can we think of that if we're talking about relational ontologies um, for the Mesolithic as well? And also, can we think about what does this say about our concern with the boundary between biological life and death and where identity and, um, I suppose, the life of a, a person um, ends and how that might continue with these uh, uh, remains after death. Um, so that went very quickly. <laughs> that was a whirlwind tour through that, so thank you very much.